that's less costly than conventional lodging, and it offers more of a variety of more utilization of vacant homes. And it has resulted in a number of vans in cities across the nation, including here in Santa Barbara, Redondo Beach, or Hermosa Beach, and etc. So that's been a big disruption, and that, that has disrupted again cities and municipalities and neighborhoods and things like that. I'm not going to get too much into that because I'm talking about this one, the autonomous vehicles. Okay. This thing's coming fast. You guys better learn how to drive an autonomous vehicle. <laughs> okay. There's 258,000 registered cars in the U.S. Really, that's what I said. <laughs> but you know, the average car is only used 4% of the time. Only used 4% of the time. Think about it. That means it's parked 96% of the time. Okay? The current model. live under and this and this is a paradigm change in what shall Shift has to be, we can summon a vehicle anytime we want to, to get someplace. See, so we go from one thing to the other. Again, it's, a, it's more efficient resource use. So what are what is the autonomous vehicle going to disrupt? It's going to disrupt everything. It's going to disrupt everything. All right, particularly parking. But the mentality change is the big thing that you have to that you have to make, is that change. Think about uh, a, a, a network of cars, a fleet ownership, where the ownership is done by Hertz or Avis or Uber or Lyft or Nissan, all right, who will provide the cars that we summon as needed, all right? And so that's the kind of mindset that we will ultimately have. Now, this won't start out this way. You'll probably own your own autonomous vehicle for a while until the fleet model takes over, probably sometime after 2030, but it's coming soon. Okay, think about all the effects on parking if we're under this mindset. All right, there's 800 million parking spaces in the U.S. That's been estimated. So think about all the parking lots, all the spaces along the street, all the meters, all the tickets that you would get. Okay, that all gets changed. We don't need any of that parking anymore. We don't need parking structures. We don't need parking spaces or along strip malls. All right, we don't, and then building requirements change. Permitting conditions that require so much parking per this and so much parking, that all goes out the window. We don't need parking anymore. All right? That land use becomes infinitely more efficient and effective. Look at all the space in towns that is dedicated to parking. We can eliminate that. We can change that over. Right? So that's a big deal. Then hospitals. Hospitals will have a lot of idle capacity because 38,000 people are killed every year in automobile accidents. 4.4 million are injured that go to the hospital. All right? That all gets eliminated because it's been shown that over 90% of all automobile accidents are due to human error. All right? So now they'll be subject to computer error. All right? It's possibly going to be a lot less. All right? And then automobiles say, we won't need as many autos. Right? Because these cars all were in operation all the time, picking and dropping off people, the same automobile over and over again, instead of parked, taking a valuable real estate in the center of town. That's all going to change. There will be a lot fewer cars needed. So think about that. Think about the taxes, the, the fees, the registration, all that stuff, sales taxes from cars, which is typically the number one you know, revenue uh, it, uh, flow into cities, sales taxes, right? And from automobiles, 
that all goes away, or at least a lot of it goes away, because a lot of these fleet ownerships will be buying directly without any sales tax implications from the manufacturers, right? And then think about car licensing and registration, all that money that goes to the state, all the fees. And then toll roads and tolling, you probably won't need those anymore. That, all of that money goes away. So there's gonna be a whole different revenue mindset change and, and how we generate revenue for cities and other and to finance other expenses. That all changes. And then think about the traffic courts. All right, ticket revenue, which is also a big revenue generator for cities and states. That all goes away. Court fines and fees, no more DUIs. Impacting what? Driver ed classes, sobriety checkpoints, fewer judges, fewer lawyers. <laughs> you, you can see that when I said Autonomous vehicles affect everything. They affect everything. All right, maintenance and insurance. You'll never have to deal with this anymore. It'll be performed by the fleet owner under an economies of scale system, so it becomes a lot cheaper. And then insurance gets pulled. And it's subject to a lot less risk anyway because we've eliminated the human factor. All right, and then car washes, auto supply stores, buying tires at Costco, gone. All limited. Eliminate it, okay? Done by the fleet owner, who can do these more efficiently and all at once. So that's a major lifestyle change. Major thing that you see, and then in jobs, there's 1.7 million truck drivers right now in the U.S. All those jobs will be gone under autonomous trucking. And 240,000 taxis, 160,000 Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, etc. Don't need them. All right, traffic and road rate informational signs. I won't need any of those. So think about the, how the landscape on highways is going to change. Rest stops, roadside restaurants, we will be able to reduce those down as well. And then your garage, and your garage doors. Hey, you can convert those to bedrooms now. <laughs> it's already storage. <laughs> it's already storage or a bedroom. Okay. Yeah, so that changes. I mean, think about that. And then what happens, but what happens to motorcycles? We don't know about that. Okay, so the timing. Now you can look any of this stuff up. There's lots of information on this. Timing 2018 to 2020, that's when the first autonomous vehicles are going to be on the road. There are already two on the road right now, two locations in the United States in which they're operating, Tempe and Pittsburgh. Okay, so you can actually take an Uber in Pittsburgh uh, in an autonomous vehicle. Okay. Uh, so and there and the companies are still sticking to this time frame, 2018 to 2020. They just came out with this a year ago, I mean a month ago, uh, an updated time frame. By 2030, it's predicted that 30 percent of all travel will be done in autonomous vehicles, and by 2040, 80 okay. percent. So it's coming fast, very quickly. You won't have to you won't have to drive, learn how to drive it. Which is what I'm facing. I've got two 15 and a half year olds. <laughs> okay, so here's the, the icon that is on the Lyft website. So today, human drivers, in five to ten years from now, you know, prior to 2030, you'll have a mix of autonomous plus human, and then after ten years, prominently autonomous vehicles will be taking over. Okay, that's what we see. Okay. The last potential talk about I'm going to talk about this one, but uh, I do want to talk about Trumponomics here. Uh, <clears throat> so what is Trumponomics? It, during the campaign, there were all these things like this. Economic policies will go badly wrong. Uh, Trump's policies could destabilize the global economy. Uh, an unmitigated disaster. The plans rely on magic pixie dust. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Robert Reich, who was uh, Clinton's labor secretary, and is an avid critic of uh, uh, Trump. Uh, so you see all these things. And this is just, you know, the continued bashing of uh, the president right now, which is taking on new heights, as we all know. Uh, so what is Trump now? So let me uh, <laughs> <laughs> talk about that. I can't speak any louder. 
I'm holding it right to my hand. Why don't you guys move close? The Trumponomics is these promises during the campaign, right? To cut taxes, both personal and corporate, and restructure all the trade deals with the, uh, the various countries and fiscal stimulus, which is basically spending on more infrastructure and on uh, defense and homeland security. All right, so we all know that. That was all campaign promises and stuff that's trying to be done right now. Okay. And in the first 140 days, other than the fake news and the unprecedented resistance, all the alleged scandals, impeachment, the alleged dementia of the president. You know, we, we have in the economy, if you follow this in the indicators, you have consumer sentiment and confidence in the economy at nearly all time record highs right now. We have the stock market at record highs. We have the value of the dollar surging. We have interest rates that shot up, but now they're kind of falling again. They really haven't moved much. Uh, mostly due to you know the Fed hikes that are coming and have come, and then but basically you have most of the economic indicators that are rising and rising sharply, and a lot of it is due to the anticipation of what Trumponomics will bring to the economy over the next year or two. Okay. So here's the U.S. Treasury bond yield, which is the benchmark interest rate in the economy today. Uh, and that was November 9th, it shot straight up after the election. Uh, but there it is today, 2.15%. It's really kind of come way back down from 2.6% uh, that we saw at the end of December and the beginning of January. So it just rates have slowly trickled down again. Not much impact there. And consumer confidence, this is the confidence board's measure. And again, this is a measure of people's optimism or pessimism in the economy, and the higher it goes, the more optimistic people become about their particular situations, their income prospects, their job prospects, their spending prospects, and it bumped up to one of the highest points we've seen in the last two decades, okay, since 2000. Same thing with the, the University of Michigan sentiment index. In May, that, was, that became the highest level since December of 2000. So again, a lot of optimism in the economy right now by, uh, by uh, Americans and American families in the U.S. Okay. Here is the, uh, the Dow as of yesterday, uh, and it's practically at an all-time record high. It's just off uh, a little bit, but uh, it continues to move upward, and that is November 9th, the day after the election, that line, and that's what's being called, of course, the Trump rally, which continues to this day. Okay. No correction. We certainly probably won't get one, but we haven't seen one yet. Uh, and we continue to see the stock market go higher and higher. Here's the unemployment rate. The other thing that's keeping people very optimistic about uh, the economy, uh, about the prospects of the economy, it's down to 4.4% at the U.S. level. Very low, lowest it's been in 10, more than 10 years. Big wages are also rising. And as his headline says, at the fastest pace that we've seen in years. And here's a picture. Basically, wages were moving laterally for years, but since 2000. Uh, but in the last you know, year or so or less, they spiked upward. So this is also uh, causing people to feel a lot better about prospects going forward. <clears throat> and uh, selling prices of their homes. Uh, are jumping. So equity is rising for everybody in home ownership. And this is at the U.S. level. It now has eclipsed the previous bubble of highs. And uh, we're at the highest levels of home prices in the U.S. for the median for the U.S. that we've ever seen before. And largely this is true in many places in California too. Okay. So with tax cuts, spending on infrastructure, spending on defense, spending on homeland security, Regulation reform, it, it, like this family, Dodd Frank, and all of the other regulatory things that have been changed through executive order, which is supposed to 
save the government hundreds of millions of dollars in enforcement costs. Uh, that is to translate into more personal income, more jobs, and more accelerated growth in the economy. Now, we don't know if this is all going to happen because Congress has got to, you know, essentially pass a lot of the bills associated with these prospects. So we'll see if that happens <coughs> next quarter. Timing, well, maybe not this year because they won't have enough chance to time to take effect. But if Congress does act, uh, particularly on the current budget, the proposed budget, which shows big increases in spending for Homeland Security, infrastructure, and defense. Uh, there are equally sizable cuts in non-defense programs, so it's not likely to increase uh, deficit issues. But the budget does show big increases this year. Uh, there's also a softening on the trade talk that we heard during the campaign. So we don't know what's gonna happen there. Uh, and tax cuts made for corporations, maybe even for families, may happen this year. Okay. Still see how that all works out, but that hasn't come up uh, as a bill of comment yet. But it's being pushed by, as you know, the administration. So the end now is repealing Obamacare. We don't quite know what that's going to do. Will health care premiums really fall? What about health care uh, industry workers? All of the infrastructure that was built up during the ACA, what's going to happen with that now? Uh, we don't really know what's going to happen with trade policy. Uh, immigration policy as well. There's a lot of tough talk, a lot of aggressive talk about that and trade, but we don't know. And then we don't know about the wall. Okay, what about the wall? So here's the, uh, the U.S.-Mexican border, in which you would build a wall. Here's how the wall would go. <coughs> San Diego to Brownsville, Texas. Right, that's 1,954 miles. Okay, but you only have to build about a thousand miles of wall because of natural barriers and obstructions that exist along the way. We figure that's going to be 12 to 15 billion. And it's going to maybe even a high estimate of 25 billion dollars. And of course, you know, Mexico's going to pay for it. <laughs> and uh, and 25,000 workers, we estimate, we, these are all, you know, really unknowns because we don't know the time. But 25,000 workers, it might take full time for about five years. Okay? So um, that's what might be what, a plausible scenario for the wall. Now, here's what we don't get here. This is it's kind of cut off at the top. That's the unemployment rate for construction workers right now in the U.S. The, the, the government does monitor unemployment rates by industry. It's one of those so there it is in 2016, it's the lowest ever. So there's not a lot of idle construction workers lying around that could be used for the wall. You know, they're all employed or they moved on to other industries during the bus. So who are we gonna get to build this? Immigrants. <laughs> We're gonna need undocumented workers. I mean, seriously. Undocumented workers, you know, from probably Mexico. We'll just make sure that when the wall's finished, they're on one side. <laughs> <laughs> what else did you do? Okay, so uh, immigration policy is a difficult one because uh, when you look at farm employment in California, which is at an all time high in 2016, despite the drought, despite the drought, uh, it's been estimated uh, by a number of research companies that 26% are undocumented. So enforcing, aggressively enforcing immigration policy would not be good for the agricultural industry here in California. You wouldn't have enough workers to deal with. All right. Or the millennials will have to go. All right. yeah. Exactly. But now even so with uh, the tourism industries, leisure and hospitality, it's been estimated that 35% are undocumented. And this is at an all-time high too. Tur tourism is flourishing in California. So, Aggressive and hostile enforcement of immigration policy would, would do damage to California's economy. So that is all the more reason why we don't think it will happen. All right, more uh, the general summary for the U.S. Stock market set all-time highs, home prices continue to move higher, wages are rising, consumers are happy, 
Inflation remains relatively contained right now. Interest rates are stable, actually moving lower. Gasoline prices remain low. The level of employment is at the full employment level, which means that wages are rising and that anyone who can talk about can get a job. And the probability of recession continues to fall. In fact, when you look at this statistic, the probability of recession, which is the likelihood that the U.S. will go into recession over the next six months, based on a number of indicators, is currently at the lowest level that it's ever been since the indicator was invented. <coughs> so it's unlikely that we're going to be in recession anytime soon for the foreseeable future, based on how the momentum in the economy right now. So don't worry. It's not going to happen unless there's some episodic major change that occurs. Okay. Consumers are largely leading the charge in the U.S. today. These are car sales going back 40 years. You can see the last three years have been very, very sharply higher, although they're starting to ebb down a little bit. Nevertheless, car sales are driving the, uh, the retail economy right now. And then home sales are at the highest point that they've been dated through April for the U.S. Uh, for the current cycle. So for the current cycle, our home sales are at the highest level. Then we created you know, millions of jobs here. That's jobs created in the U.S. all the way through into 2017. And that we're in unprecedented territory for the number of consecutive months that positive job creation has occurred in the U.S. It's never occurred this consecutively since the history of the country. And that's the kind of job market that we're in. These, this says job openings all the way through March, and job openings are at an all-time high for the site. In fact, they're at an all-time high for, since this indicator came out. So there's lots of jobs that aren't filled yet. They're open and unfilled, and they're at high. Five, six million jobs unfilled. So no slowdown, no recession. The economy remains strong. There is a lot of optimism. Consumers are the ones that are leading the charge, and even the global economy, which I really haven't talked about, looks a lot better than previous years. You don't hear a lot of stuff about Greece these days. China's uh, healing, uh, in general, is subject to faster growth as well. Okay, so. Uh, consensus forecast on GDP, that's what it was last year, 1.6, very modest. And this year it's predicted to be about two and a half. And then if Trump and Donald's policies do kick in, uh, we're looking at a much sharper growth in 2018. Okay. So it doesn't appear that any slowdown is in the cards at all for the foreseeable future. After 2018, things get real blurry, so we don't know. Uh, so that should hopefully drive the way that you know you might be working or doing business going forward. Let me talk about California. The tech sector is the driving, you know, the driving industry here. Software, data, circuit boards, artificial intelligence, and employment rates down to 4.8. Travel industries. Uh, travel's never been in, at a higher level of activity. In California. Record year for passenger in payments and details. San Francisco, LAX, Sunbury Field, Sacramento International. Um, and despite the strong dollar, which would normally damper you know, our, uh, uh, exports, uh, the ports are extremely busy. Record levels of cargo is coming in and out of California ports. There's more housing being built in the Bay Area now than there has been in. 10, 12 years. Same thing with Los Angeles and Orange Counties. We're seeing a major response to home building and uh, a lot more commercial and industrial facilities. In fact, we're at record levels in the investment in new commercial and industrial structures in California right now. That's what's going on. Record levels of new development. You wouldn't know it by being here, but it is occurring. There's lots of downtown San Francisco and Los Angeles and a lot of the larger cities. Santa Clara, Oakland, San Diego, lots of new development. Okay, here's employment technology in California. It's exponentially increasing. It's at all-time record highs. Can't hire the people fast enough. 
You can't get people fast enough that are skilled in these industries. And this is where most of the job openings are that are remain unfilled and they take a lot longer to fill. So this is causing recruitment nightmares for HR departments throughout the country. And the technology, software, video, data processing, web, hosting, uh, computer architecture of all types. And that's the leading indicators of uh, leading engines of growth for jobs. Here's total passenger <laughs> LX. I mean, just off the charts right now. We've seen such a growth in passenger uh, employments and deployments. Okay, in, uh, in these airports. Lindbergh Field, the same way as I indicated, all of the airports. Okay, that was 2011. So after 2011, really things took off. However, not so true here. Okay, so there's passengers at the Santa Barbara Airport, completely opposite all the major metropolitan areas. Okay, that's when the new terminal opened in August of 2011. Okay, and you can see what's happened since then. Uh, a little bit more response in 2016. And I think passengers are up a little bit this year as well from what I've been reading. But in general, we haven't seen the same response here. Uh, Santa Barbara doesn't have as quite a vibrant economy as some of the uh, big metro, metro areas of California right now. Let me talk about this. The employment rate is 4%. That's the lowest it's been in 10 years. Everyone has a job. Commercial real estate is red hot. It's very hard to find space. New apartment units are underway in town and in Goleta. Uh, we've seen a recent rebound of the tax industry, but only recently. And uh, a lot of that's been led by Procore out in Carpinteria. Big engines are UCSB, Casino, uh, <coughs> and sector, and some tax like Procore. Uh, there's a job created, I showed it to you in the US, there is for Santa Barbara. We're actually running a little bit higher this year for the first four months of the year. So that's their annual rate for the first four months of the year, a little bit higher. A lot of it's in hospitality, some of it's in government, public jobs. But we've had seven years of uh, very positive and meaningful job growth here in Santa Barbara. It's, we're at all-time record highs in employment, and nearly all-time record highs in unemployment, but not quite. So here's your largest organizations. We did this survey <coughs> December or January of this year, so it's relatively fresh. Okay, so you see these top in the county of Santa Barbara, there's cottage, city college, and school districts. You can see that most of the largest employers are public, public entities, public organizations. Okay, and cottage isn't, but it's one of the few uh, exceptions. Uh, city of Santa Barbara, Samson, Raytheon, Bacara, and Yard and Four Seasons, Citrix. Okay, so that's the most recent list of the largest guys in, in the South Coast area. Uh, that's professional, technical, and scientific employment. So there's your, your higher tech and your technology kinds of jobs that are amenable here for Santa Barbara, particularly for the higher cost of living. You can see we had this big fallout during the recovery and expansion that we haven't seen in other places. So we have had ebb and flow of a lot of professional and technical jobs here. So if, if you're asking the question, well, what jobs are we creating? Uh, are we creating the kind of tech, technology jobs that we're sort of known for? And the answer is no, not really. But we've had fallout since 2011, uh, 2012, although it's come back a little bit here in recent months. And downsizing. Raytheon, Allergan, Mentor, these, these are the years in which we've seen significant. Now Channel Islands, Channel uh, Technologies went uh, bankrupt. DuPont Displays moved back to New Jersey. Sonos had downsized, Citrix downsized, Curvature just a little bit. Linda.com, of course, was uh, peddled to LinkedIn. They downsized. And then in the retail ranks, we've seen Saks downsized meaningfully. And of course, Macy's closed. So we've had a lot of downsizings 
uh, in retail and in technology here in Santa Barbara. Okay. Hotel Motel 2014, 2015, 2016. The, the rate for the first three months of the year is running a lot lower. Probably because of all rain in January and February that cut lower in occupancy rates because we want to come. So that may be boosted back up as the year goes on. But right now, that's the annual rate given uh, <clears throat> some of the softness in the hotel industry this year. But it's been hot. It's been running up significantly. The average daily room right now is $190 a night. That's the average for all hotels. I did a, a particular study on this and we looked at beach uh, hotels. So this is in the beach zone, so this is in the coastal zone. Uh, so this is all the hotels down on the beach and, and along the coast. And the, the rate is a lot higher, as you can see. It's running up at $270 this year on average, the average for any night of the week. So there you go. <coughs> Uh, are we building much? No, not really. You can see that uh, this is the number of units that we build every year or that we authorize to build every year in the city of Santa Barbara. This goes all the way back here to 40 years. And uh, 30 years. And, uh, you know, it's about the same. We I mean, had a little bit of a run up in the last couple of years, but this year we're running about the same as what we've been at. So, not a lot of building, even though you see a lot more high profile projects in town. Here they are, here's the big projects uh, in the south coast, right? So uh, those Illus Paris is underway, Heritage Ridge, that's right next to it, it's not under the best apartments. Cortona is approved, but uh, in Galita, but not uh, underway. Old Town is underway, and then the Tree Farm is underway. Okay, and then uh, in Santa Barbara you have uh, Neal's project of Mesa Lane, uh, that's not approved yet. That's in the funk zone. That would be apartments. The Gardens on Hope is a senior project. The Mark is almost done. That's that one has Lacumbra and State. Uh, the gallery, I call it the gallery apartment project. Do you, do you know what that one is? Yeah. 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 Mow down the gallery and build 85 apartments. Okay. And then Stanzi is the old Santa Man Inn. That's underway, I think. Installed for a while, uh, and then uh, there's a housing authority one that hasn't started. That's uh, uh, and then for non-residential projects, Cottage Hospital continues with all of their stuff, and they they've got 200,000 more square feet to build. Old Town Industrial Center on Kellogg is in planning for leader. That's a big facility. Okay, big. The Rio Business Park still has 150,000 square feet left to build out there. Uh, and then uh, the Waterfront Hotel by uh, the Best Parker family, uh, that's still on the books. It's just kind of, they keep extending that. A hotel in Goleta, uh, the Marinette Residence Inn out in Goleta, that's underway, that's at Stork and in Hollister. Uh, Lagunitas Office Park in Carpentry has been approved for years, nobody wants to build that, it's approved. Uh, I think they're going to break that up into smaller buildings and make it a campus setting, so we'll see how that goes. And then we'll be right now. Where's Target? Where's what? Where's Target? There is no Target. <laughs> There's been a lot of attempts, as we know. Okay, retail vacancy rate. City of Santa Barbara. Look at that. Look at that spike. Basically because of Macy's, right? But <coughs> But uh, there it is. Retail is running around 1%, 2% for years and years and years. And now it's spiked all the way up to 3 which is still low. But you can see how what perspective our retail situation is relative to where it has been. We've doubled vacancy. Mark, what would that look like if you took Macy's out of picture? It would still be higher. It would still be higher because uh, here's all these closures. Now, some of these have been replaced uh, and are part of the normal ebb and flow of a restaurant, births and deaths, right? But we've seen a spate of them. These have all been closed. <coughs> and uh, Ahi Sushi got replaced by uh, Sun, right? So, yeah, it's a 
cool place now. And the International Cafe got replaced by a Thai place. Uh, and, you know, all, all those is an open. Yeah, Luke Dean's closed, Lawrence closed, all these. Sojourner is getting, uh, they, they're getting. Be so hungry. Be, that's right. And, how do you know? <laughs> recent okay, so the recent this this is a, this is my last disruption. Uh, vacancy rates on Fifth Avenue and Times Square, thirty one percent. Right now, right now, okay. Macy's, Sears, Payless, American Apparel, Limited, Wetsuit, and Disney all have announced thousands of store closures this year. Thousands. Here's the chart. Number of retail stores closing in 2017. Payless, 1,000. Radio Shack, 552. There's JCPenney, Kmart, Staples, Macy's, 68 stores. It goes on and on. Okay. Why? <laughs> Thousands of these stores are in malls. So this could cause a lot of calamity in the mall for all of us. But all mall owners are replacing them with restaurants, a lot of restaurants, theaters, and these experiential retail tenants, okay? Uh, like Kids Aid, have you heard of this? This is a kind of normally around here. This is a kind of a children's experience, uh, role-playing experience in, in a number of cities that they can do, that you, that you take them to. It's a couple of hours thing. Uh, and so that's an experiential thing. Or things like Orange Theory, which is of course, going into Kyrie Al Center, we see those opening up in strip centers everywhere, and other fitness uh, uh, kinds of uh, operations, then art galleries and theaters that present plays and lectures, such as you know the one in, in San Diego. You're seeing those open up too. You can take it over to some ancient systems. So, uh, mall owners have been largely successful in being able to uh, uh, replace a lot of these closures. But we'll see how successful they are going forward. Here is the retail vacancy rate in Los Angeles County, uh, not going that fast, as of the first quarter of this year. And we don't see any fallout in general. We don't see it yet. But we may, ultimately. We're likely to. Okay? Retail fallout is big. When you look at retail sales, uh, they continue to rise higher and higher. This is adjusted for inflation. There may be a little bit of plateauing occurring here, but you know, not much. People are still buying stuff, but not that much stuff. When you look at stuff, consumers are buying goods and uh, cars and goods and 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 homes and some goods, uh, but not at the, with the same exuberance as they have. Boomers, boomer baby boom generation, not buying as much stuff. They don't want the stuff anymore. Okay, uh, they're saving and they're experiencing. A lot more travel, right? More services, more travel. That's what we're seeing. Millennials aren't buying many goods either. And millennials are now the biggest generation that have to replace the boomers. Although they're buying phones, food, and booze. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. You ask them, that's what they'll say. <laughs> okay? But not much else. But they don't have any money to buy anything else. Uh, and more being. Be, uh, retail buying, it clearly is online, right? So here's online e-commerce retail sales as a percentage of all retail sales. And it just continues to rise much more steeply and steeply all the time. But now, it still only makes up 9% of all retail, but nevertheless, it's been rising sharply. In fact, it's tripled in the last 11 years. So if you were buying $100 worth of stuff in 2006, you're now buying $300 worth of stuff online. And here is, well, here's Amazon stock price all the way up until this morning. It's at an all-time record high. Okay, it's gone up 40% in just the last year. So there's your stock tip. Buy Amazon a year ago. <laughs> okay. It's a thousand dollars a share, which makes it hard to buy. Okay? So uh, unless you can buy fractional shares. Here's office vacancy rates by city. Carpinteria, Santa Barbara, Goleta, they are relatively low, as you can see. 
uh, compared to, say, Ventura, which is 20%. And office vacancy over time in the South Coast has basically eroded to, you know, to very, very low rates, and we're at the cycle low. So office space, very tight. Industrial space, extremely tight, virtually none. 1% rates, if that. <coughs> less in carpentry and less in Santa Barbara. Okay. Let me talk about the housing market for the rest of the time. Uh, 2017 is shaping up to be the best sales year of the business cycle nationwide. All right, prices have soared in nearly all markets across the country. Not all, but mostly. And inventory remains extraordinarily tight. In fact, the industry statistics, inventory statistics for, for California have never been low. The tightest they've ever been. Apartment vacancy is extremely low. Rents continue to soar. There is some response with new housing, but not much. Not much. And there won't be. Certainly not enough. Here, here, I've been seeing these things. This just came out two days ago. Who's powering the housing market? Surprise, it's the millennials. Same day, another article. Six reasons why millennials aren't buying homes. <laughs> Same day, that was two days ago. Then this says, <coughs> it says, millennials aren't buying homes. Good for them. <laughs> okay, good for them because they don't have, if you read the article, they don't have the, uh, the finances for it. Okay, and then the struggle is real for millennial homeowners. Anyway, I think the short of it is millennials aren't buying homes. Right? Yet, but uh, home buying is at its highest uh, for the cycle, but it's still relatively low. Here's home ownership for the population of under 35. Millennials. Right. And it, it, you know, it peaked uh, 10, 15 years ago at 43, 44%, and now it's all the way down to 34%. It's at the low, one of the lowest levels it's ever been. And so millennials aren't buying homes. They're just not. That's home ownership. Existing home sales in California, that's how it looks in the 2017, going way back, going back to 1981. So you can see for the past several years since the recession, it's been basically steady. There really hasn't been a big change in home selling, home buying, in California. You know, there was a little bit of a blip there due to all the uh, foreclosures and short sales that occurred. You know, big companies swooping in and buying thousands of homes in California to rent them out. But other than that, it's basically been pretty steady, pretty stable. You don't really see this as a recovery or, or an expansionary uh, uh, characteristic of the housing market. There is, hasn't been really been one. Prices, of course, have gone up. And prices in many areas are one of all time record highs, and that's the the price for April in California. It's very high, right up against 550,000 for the median home in the state. Unsold housing inventory, however, is at the lowest level since records have been kept this year. That's what it's running at. Very low levels. So that's the average number of units available per month in thousands. And we've gone from two, three hundred, close to 300,000 down to just over 100,000. So it's a very, very short supply of homes for sale in California. Here's the median time to sell uh, a home. And this is for Southern California in the Bay Area. So it's running in about 39 days in Southern California. You can see how that has eroded over time. And in the Bay Area, it's half that. It takes record time to sell because of all the multiple offers. And so it, uh, and the housing market is exuberant there. So uh, I just took these for April. This was because uh, I had these. Uh, this is for April. This is the median price sold. You can see San Mateo, San Francisco, Marin, those are the high ends. And then uh, if you put Santa Barbara and South Coast in, that's where they uh, it would fall for April. It's a little bit lower year to date, but that's the April number. Santa Clara, Alameda, you can just pick out your favorite county. But let's see, percentage change from a year ago. I mean, these are not low rates. Of, Think of, of uh, inflationary increase in home prices or high rates. 
And then uh, I just wanted to point out that Los Angeles, Los Angeles had a huge response in the median house that's selling here. It's up 98% since 2012. Okay, from 350 to about 700,000. The median house sold in the city of Los Angeles. The city of Los Angeles has got one of the uh, most robust economies in the nation. Right now, the unemployment rate has never been lower in the history of the city. More job creation there than ever before since 1984. It's extremely vibrant in Los Angeles right now. So, sales pace this year about the same as last year. In fact, about the same as the last four years. Not much change here. There's more inventory this year. In fact. There is uh, the most this year, uh, the last year and this year, than since 2012. Not much price appreciation in the last four years. More purchases in 2016 for investment when I look at the home buyer survey, which I'll share with you at the end. Uh, and there are more non local buyers. Few, <coughs> not many. All right, so that, those are the changes. That, that's kind of the summary of what we're seeing. So there's the sales in the South Coast. There's this year's rate. I think I have it for the first five months, so that's January through May, that's the pace. So then if that continued for the rest of the year, that's where you'd end up. <coughs> okay, so again, not much change in the last four years. About the same. Okay, you can see there were these big spikes with the short sales and stuff that occurred in the aftermath of uh, the recession, which was there. Uh, active listings, uh, there's been some additional ones, unlike California, there's been a little bit more active listings from what we can tell, looking at the flex statistics. There was that little surge last year that we were, the, the numbers are showing right now. And that's uh, uh, homes and condos. And then here is the inventory for uh, detached, which you call estates. <coughs> So in the South Coast, there are 392 total homes for sale, okay? 400 homes for sale right now. 44 of them are a million or less. Only 44. 118 are one to two million. And 230 of them are two million or above. So that's your distribution. Okay, and if I take out Hope Branch and Montecito, uh, of course you get the same there for you know a million or under. You get uh, 101, and then but only 75 uh, homes if you take out Hope Branch and Montecito are over two million. So most of them are, as you can see, in Hope Branch and Montecito, needless to say. And if you take out Hope Branch and Montecito, you only have about half the inventory. So Hope Branch of Montecito, mostly Montecito, has a, a large amount of inventory. Which you will, of course, no, I'm just confirming that with the numbers. Um, here is sales to date, first five months of the year. Carpentry is up sharply. Montecito down. Uh, Hope Branch is up, but of course the numbers. So we'll go back to that. Uh, Bolita South is up, Bolita North about the same, and total South Coast is up about 7% for the first five months of the year. Okay, so not much change, but that's how the numbers bear out. Here's the prices. <clears throat> There's Hope Ranch and Montecito, the big outliers, but in general, prices are moving just like you'd expect. The total for the South Coast is about 1.2 million for the first five months of the year, okay. down a fraction from the first five months of 2016, down a fraction. And uh, there's how the prices move over time, that's the South Coast at the top, of everything, and then if I extract from a CEO of branch, you can see that it's lower, but it moves exactly the same, but less volatile. So the price hasn't changed much over the last four years. Okay, there it is for uh, 2016, 1.17 million down slightly 
and if I take out a whole branch, it's at about a million. Whole branch of Montecito, it's about a million, down about 1% over the last year. So not much change over the last few years. And our percentage of sales over a million, okay, 60, 60% 60 of sales are over a million dollars. 25% of sales are over $2 million. And of course, that's up relative to where it's been the last few years. And the highest since 2007. Condo sales, uh, the prices are down about 10%. Sales running in the South Coast are up about 4% over a year ago. Prices are down a little bit. So, not a lot to say about condos. Uh, there they are, there's a movement over time in sales, a lot less, a lot less inventory. Active listings of condos, there they are, the city inventory has diminished in the last four or five months of this year. Okay. Selling price of condos, uh, basically kind of steady, right around that 600. Thousand mark six hundred and fifty thousand. That's the uh, the price for me. I'm talking about the rental market really quick. Rental rate, uh, uh, vacancy rates in California are at an all-time record low, the tightest it's ever been. In uh, Galena, Santa Barbara, and Carp, forty-two percent of the housing stock is rental. That's about twenty-four thousand units. 55% of the population rents. Vacancy rates 1.7% from the Dyer Sheehan numbers and 1.7% from Santa Barbara Rental Property Association. Average monthly rent was up about 3% over a year ago. Okay, so there's apartment rents in the South Coast, $1,900 a month for all the units combined. And you can see the run-up has been quite steep the last several years through October of last year. Dyer Sheehan does an April one, but they haven't released the statistics yet. 23% gain since 2012 in average rents. Apartment vacancy in the South Coast has run all the way up to 1.7% recently. You can see it was down to uh, half of a percent. So things have loosened up, but you really wouldn't notice it. Very, very tight market here. And then there's where there's Santa Barbara and there's Santa Barbara County and you add except Rio Lombo. Still tight. Uh, I compare it with other places like LA, Orange, San Francisco, et cetera. They're all very, very tight markets. And then finally, I want to talk about who's buying homes because many of you participate in this. Village does and some others that we do. <clears throat> so this was, covers the last half of 2016. There were 344 surveys turned in. That represented 41% of all the sales. It was a good sale. <coughs> 13 agents participate plus all of those. Uh, the median price for the survey was about the same as what I just showed you. And condo prices similarly. And there was even mobile homes of 288,000. So again, yeah, very representative of what the entire market is going for. Uh, this is the percent of uh, surveys that are single family versus condos, and it's running about 7%. It hasn't changed much. You can see that. Okay, buyer's reason for purchasing a home, the primary for the, to, to, to live in it, the primary, uh, as their primary home, to live in it. That's ebbed down a little bit, but not that much. And then a uh, secondary home, Secondary home and an investment home are a lot lower, as you can see. But actually, the investment numbers are ticking up a little bit. So the primary uh, reason for buying, of course, is to live in it. But we are seeing uh, a little bit higher response right there. So the average uh, number of uh, percentage of home sales that uh, are, are, are bought for investment purposes is about 12% over the last 10 years of our survey. 10, 12 years, but uh, in the most recent survey, it was up to 15. So a little bit higher response for investment. 
And that's the origin of the buyer. So the average over the last 10, 10 years uh, was around 32% are from the South Coast, <coughs> from outside the South Coast. So they're uh, foreign buyers, essentially. Uh, but in the last two years, we've actually seen that tick up a little bit, not much. So if you think that you know, you're being invaded by people from Los Angeles and San Francisco, it's not true. It's be local buyers buying homes here. Percent of primary homeowners that are downsizing, moving on, getting out of their big home in Santa Barbara, or their expensive home in Santa Barbara, and getting into something smaller, you can see that isn't true. People aren't doing that. It ticked up a little bit in the most recent uh, survey, but not much. Most people are, buy, are moving laterally or buying a bigger home or more expensive. Uh, that's all I have on that. Let me give you the forecast, which I just have a couple slides on. So I'm almost done. Trumponomics, you shouldn't be afraid of it. In fact, you should probably embrace it. It's likely to give more growth to the U.S. economy, more stimulus, more business, more income, more of everything in 2018, certainly, if uh, Congress approves some of uh, Then not much change after that. Not much change, because the fiscal stimulus would have to continue, and it's not likely to. So we'll likely see uh, a slowdown after 2018. In fact, it's at that time we should start thinking about another recession. Okay. So for the next two year, year and a half, you're pretty safe. But after 2018, things get blurry. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen in uh, Congress and what happens there, although that isn't a big factor. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen in the rest of the world economy either. But statistically, as I talked to you last year about this, we will be due after 2018 for a recession. We don't know where it's coming from. But they happen about every nine years lately. And the last one was 2009. <coughs> so uh, we'll need to be thinking about that. Okay. For now, however, the economy remains in a full employment status. And full employment status simply means that salaries and other costs are rising right now because resources are scarce. Resources are very scarce. Um, so look for inflation to move a little bit higher. But for interest rates to go up because the Fed's going to continue its normalization policy by raising rates, trying to get its rates back up. So that's going to happen. Uh, inflation will go higher. Home prices are likely to move higher too. It's just not building. And demand is very strong. And the economy is going to remain probably very strong for the next at least 18 months, as I've said. Rents will continue to move higher. Prices of all types will move, move higher. And then the affordability of housing, of course, which is becoming an issue in many areas of California, is going to continue to grow as an issue and become more problematic. Okay. This isn't going to change. I don't know if it's going to change during the recession. It probably should moderate some. So if you're waiting to buy a house, I would wait till the recession hits. <laughs> you know, but even then, uh, we don't know because the supply. Prices are not going up at the same way that they went up in 2006. That was due to speculation and easy financing conditions. We don't have either one of those now. Okay, people are buying homes because they need them. They want them. Supply and demand. And not a speculative bubble and not a financing bubble. So, uh, this, so, but nevertheless, affordability is an issue. No, and that's one of the reasons why home ownership is so low and why renting is so tight and why the millennials have to choose renting right now. And so apartment investments are you know, a very lucrative deal. So 2017, 2018, uh, much higher likelihood of stronger growth after that. All bets are on. Okay? So you've got a few months to make hay. Okay, I think that's it. That's all.
should have. I should have.